So I'm asked all the time, Detective Mains, what can I do to keep my stuff off the internet? All my personal information. Well, I don't like that stuff out there. I don't want people to know my voting preference. I don't want people to know my cell phone number. I don't want people to know my address. I'm a private person. I don't want that stuff out there for people to take advantage of me. That's why I use Data Seal. Okay? It personally is the comprehensive data removal service that I trust. So use the link below to receive 5% off of your Data Seal subscription and protect you and your family. If you have concerns that your personal information is being exposed online, use Data Seal. It's the one that I trust and I use personally. So listen guys, there's a link in the bio and in the comment sections. Click on that link and you'll get 5% off of your subscription. So make sure you go ahead and do that. 1946, the custody battle started. And here's a picture of her during her custody hearing. Um, it's just amazing to me because she wasn't like a big starlet, but yet there's photographs of her at this custody hearing. I find that intriguing. Not necessarily odd, just intriguing. So, 1946 are the custody hearings in which it's a battle between father and uh, mother, and that's nothing unusual. But what is usual is the heated, tense, and sometimes hate that's spewed between the two parties. Now, I can't say that here because I don't know for sure. The only way you would know that is if it was documented somewhere or you talked to a person who was familiar with both of them. But what's important here is I want to show that it's 1946, okay, when this is happening. She disappeared in 1949. So a full three years removed from these custody hearings. Now, who won the custody hearings? I think she won uh, initially, or he won initially, and then it went to her. Then she disappeared, and then he got custody. So it seemed like it was a back-and-forth affair. One of the things that he brought up is that she was an unfit mother because of her lifestyle. Apparently, she liked to go out a lot, not unlike a lot of young mothers. She was 26 in L.A. So, I don't find that too odd. But what I want to do is I want to jump to the day of her disappearance. Like I said, victimology is very important here, as it is in every case, yet we don't know too much about her other than she worked at a nightclub and I think this was before she started becoming an actress and having bit parts in movies in fact she had a bit part in a Kirk Douglas movie and that is going to become relevant here in a little bit when we go over the evidence so on the day she disappears young Jean Spang Spangler Around 5 o'clock p.m., tells her daughter, who is being, she was five years old, I believe, at the time, who's being babysat by some friends and relatives. Uh, Jean lived with her mom at the time, but her mom was out of town, which is very important when it comes to the evidence as well. So she left her there and said, I will be back, and the daughter asked, you know, where are you going, Mommy? She says, I got to go to work. And then she winked. Could you see that wink with my black eye? My swollen eye? I don't know if you could see that. That's what Jean did. She winked, not at her daughter, but at the individual that was babysitting. Now, I think that's important. Because we come to find out, the police checked with the Screen Actors Guild and there was no movie set working that day. In fact, she wasn't scheduled to work that day. So in all intent and purposes, I think we can say that she was not working. It's 5 p.m. 
on October 7th, 1949. She is seen about an hour later at a supermarket browsing by a, a witness. I think it was one, the clerk. Now, normally, I don't put a lot of stock into eyewitness testimony, saying I've seen somebody here, there. That. I do in this one, and I'll tell you why. Because Jean was a starlet. By that, I mean she wasn't a star yet. But she was very beautiful, very attractive, and I think she would have stuck out being there. And that would have drawn the person's eyes to her. <coughs> Excuse me. And plus, it was not far from where she lived. Therefore, she probably frequented that supermarket before. The eyewitness says it appears that she was waiting for somebody. Now, how does he know that? Well, I think you can tell that by body language, by looking around a lot, um, milling around, really not doing anything. Uh, I think you can tell that. If you're not shopping, putting stuff into a cart, and you're kind of like looking at magazines, you could infer that you are waiting for somebody. That's the last time she's ever seen, folks. That's it. She didn't come home that night. And so right away they filed a missing persons report. Again, I don't think they probably took it too seriously, but on October 9th, the next day after she's reported missing, her the very first piece of evidence is found, her purse. And her purse is found in Griff, Griffith Observatory. Now I'm familiar with this because when I first went out to Los Angeles, uh, five years ago to do my first filming out there. I went there. One, because it was it dealt with space, which I'm fascinated by. Just blows my mind that of all of our technology, we can't see the end of it. It's just infinite. My mind can't wrap around that. So I am I am fascinated with it. Number two, Jim Morrison went there for a photo shoot. And I remember seeing pictures of it and I wanted to be there. So, I'm familiar with it. Had I known that her purse was found there, I would have went to that location as well. But her purse was found there, and what was significant about that, it was it was at the, let me make sure I get this right, and the, it was an entranceway to the, what was it, the, the Fern Garden maybe? Uh but it was the entrance way there and the strap was broke. I was able to find this picture which is crazy and it's in uh, the you, know, you can see the cop holding it. You know, so let's say there this picture never existed. And today the investigator said, "You know what? I think the offender handled that purse. So we're going to swab it for DNA. What are you going to get, guys? You're going to get mixed DNA, which happens in a lot of these old cases because of this very reason. He doesn't have gloves on. He not his fault. He isn't thinking 50 years, 60 years down the road that we're going to be able to get DNA and link it to a suspect because he touched something. Um but I just found this photo rather intriguing. Inside that pocket book slash purse is a letter. Okay? And you can see what the letter reads. It's addressed to Kirk. Can't wait any longer. Going to see Dr. Scott. It's best, you know, his mom's out of town. Now what can you infer from that? I'll tell you what I infer. Number one, it was written recently because mom being out of town. Remember when I said this was going to be important down the road? Well, there you go. It shows that it was probably written current. Two, it's addressed to Kurt. Three, Dr. Scott. So, that's... Huge, huge clues right there, okay? 
Now, police, obviously, they think like me and you think, hey, we got to follow up on this and we have good clues here. Let's find out who Kirk is. Well, they couldn't find she was associated with anybody but who? Kirk Douglas. Tabloids ran with that. So much so that Kirk Douglas, who was on vacation in Florida, calls police and says, hey, this is Kirk Douglas. I don't know who that girl is. I've been in vacation. He retracted that story a little bit a few days later via his agent and said, wait a second. After he talked to some people, he did know Jean Spangler. She worked as an extra and he kidded around with her on occasion, but never went out with her and doesn't really know her. Okay, that's Kirk's word, his alibi. He's out of state. Dr. Scott, who is this? Well, they found a couple of Dr. Scotts and they all denied that, you know, they knew who Gene Spagler was. So, that's the evidence. Those are the clues that we have. Now, are we able to figure out, are we able to deduce what happened to Gene? Well, when you have a missing person, as usual, you have to look at the runaway, you have to look at the foul play. Or, you can throw natural causes in there, you can put suicide in there, but we're not there yet, right? Because we don't even have a body, it's just a missing person. So what we have to figure is, did she go missing on her own accord, meaning, hey, I've had enough, whatever it is, I'm out. Or, the other end of that, did she meet foul play? 